Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 17. Well, first of all, first of all some burrow keeping. Um, last week's episode was done a bit on the fly and was a bit more rough around the edges than usual, for which I apologise. I was having an interesting week, not least because of finding a new job and having to have a tooth out. There was also another very annoying sound drop last week at 8 minutes 20, which I didn't notice until I published. The full phrase was, quote, The chapter opens on the evening of the following day after the group left the Warren of the Snares. What is it about the word snares that keeps going wrong? Is my tech trying to object to it? Anyway, I'm taking steps to ensure such sound drops don't happen again, starting with this episode. Please also note that I have edited the podcast description to make it clear that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for reading the original book or watching one of the film versions of Watership Down. There will be spoilers aplenty, so if you're listening to this having never read the book or watched one of the film versions, I urge you to switch this off and do so immediately. Am I trying to avoid getting in trouble with the estate of Richard Adams, the author? You bet I am. I urge you to buy his books and watch any films based upon them, not least because I love his work. This podcast is a product of that love. Chapter 19. Fear in the Dark. The opening quotation from Thomas Hardy speaks of a pale messenger who will soon be known. A very well-selected quote. The burrows and runs discovered by Hawkbit are rough but dry. They've been dug in chalky soil, but the rabbits are too tired to care. Bigwig says that they suit a bunch of hlesil like them. This is a lapine word meaning rabbits without a warren. The singular is hlesi. Hazel is looking after Buckthorn's wound from the rat attack of the previous night. He reflects that three of them have been hurt now, but that things could have been a lot worse. The short summer night passes quickly, and the rabbits sleep after dawn. Adams explains how human noise can disturb wildlife and how that has got worse in recent years. Bearing in mind that he was writing half a century ago, imagine how much worse this is now. But high up on the downs, such noise is much reduced. Upon waking, Hazel goes out to Silfley. The mist is burning off the fields below, and it is going to be a hot day. He wonders what they had to learn about their new home, and what became of the rabbits who dug these holes on the scarp slope. Blackberry joins him, and they feed together. They discuss the unfamiliarity of the plants and smells on the down, and what they need to do now. Hazel comments that many of the group will probably have to sleep in the open as bucks or male rabbits don't dig burrows, which begs the question that if finding the burrows they just slept in was so important, what kind of plan for their long-term future did Hazel have when he led them to this place? Blackberry reminds him of the unrabbit-like habits of the Roran of the Snares, and here a contradictory notion I previously raised is addressed. If they found those rabbits carrying food underground so strange, how come food used to be taken underground to the Threara, the chief in their old warren? Here, Blackberry cleverly connects the idea of rabbits doing unrabbit like things to something that was already happening in their warren. This leads to a radical idea. Buck rabbits don't dig burrows because does dig them as part of providing shelter for their litters, but they could if they chose to. The holes they have just slept in are no good for expanding. It is clear they have been abandoned because they are in hard, rocky soil of the kind that occurs near the surface on downland scarp slopes. Blackberry's idea is to dig in a small wood or beach hanger he saw at the top of the slope. They both go to the top to check it out. Blackberry says that without shelter this is a bleak place and will be impossible to stay in in winter. But the roots of the trees will have broken up the soil, making digging easier. As they return down the slope, Hazel mentions the conversation only to Fiverr. Later, he suggests a few of them go back and check out the wood at the top. They all end up going. The beach hanger is unlike the woods they are used to. It is a lot more open and is a narrow belt of trees running away from the scarp slope towards the south. They come to the northeast corner of the hanger where there is a bank. Fiverr comments that Blackberry is right. This is ideal for digging. Although this shocks several of the group, several of them are soon digging, led by Hazel and Pickpin. They realise that kestrels are common here, though little risk to full-grown rabbits. All the same, they try to avoid them and the alarm is raised when one is spotted. 
This happens a couple of more times during the afternoon. Later in the afternoon, a man on a horse riding along the down the ridge disturbs them as well. But apart from these interruptions, they are not disturbed at all. Hazel suggests going back to the bottom of the hill to find some good grass. Bigwig, Dandelion and Speedwell join him, while the others make their way back to the burrows on the scarp slope. Once at the bottom of the hill, Hazel finds an old overgrown ditch to use for cover if needed before they all start feeding at the edge of a wheat field. Bigwig comments on the different quality of the soil at the top of the hill, and Hazel mentions the possibility of trying to copy the great burrow they saw at the Warren of the Snares. Bigwig points out the danger of the roof falling in if a burrow is made too large. It will need tree roots to help keep this from happening. Hazel suggests they consult Strawberry about what he knows about digging such a burrow, though it was probably finished long before he was born. The sun has set at the foot of the down. Suddenly, they hear a rabbit stamping an alarm, followed by another. They both dash to the ditch. Speedwell and Dandelion join them fast. They have both heard an animal approaching clumsily along the line of the hedge. They wonder what it could be. A cat? A stoat? They wait as darkness falls. Suddenly, they hear a strange, unnatural wailing. Bigwig becomes convinced it is the black rabbit of Inlay. Hazel tells him to stop talking like that, but then they hear it again. It is clearly the voice of a rabbit, but unlike any they have heard before, it is utterly desolate. Then they hear words, the first of which is Zorn, meaning destroyed, followed by the phrase All Dead and then it calls out Bigwig's name. Bigwig, now completely convinced it is the Black Rabbit, starts her to make his way towards the voice, saying that you have to go when you are called, but Hazel gets his wits together enough to push past and stop him. Hazel pulls himself out of the ditch and sees a rabbit underneath the hedge. He asks him who he is. Dandelion joins Hazel and they approach the rabbit who is utterly exhausted with his legs trailing behind him. His eyes are wide and one ear is ripped and bloody. He cries out as if wanting to be hunted down and killed. It is Captain Holly of the Sandalford Owsler. Next time, Holly is looked after. Work begins on a new great burrow. And Hazel makes friends with a mouse. Mm -hmm.